Welcome to another episode of the Armourer's Bench. Today we're going to take a look at a little known type of weapon which rose to prominence around the time of the First World War, with a number of examples being developed and some even tested. As you can see from this footage, it's something pretty unconventional. Seen here, mounted on the back of a truck, is a centrifugal machine gun. I came across this footage while I was doing some digging through the online catalogue of the US National Archives. The centrifugal machine gun was not a new concept by the time this footage was filmed in the early 1920s. While the technology had risen to a new prominence, what was the actual allure of the centrifugal machine gun? The principle of centrifugal force, an inertial force which appears to act on objects moving in a circular path, directs them away from the axis of rotation. As a result, a centrifugal machine gun would require no propellant powder or a case to contain it, and it wouldn't require a conventional rifled barrel to stabilise the projectile either. Once released from the axis of rotation, the projectile travels on a linear trajectory until it expends its remaining energy. The primary issue is providing power to exert the centrifugal force and a means of accurately aiming and firing the projectiles. Some of the earliest work on centrifugal guns was done in the late 1850s in the US. The hand crank or steam powered guns patented by William Joslin and Charles S. Dickinson in the late 1850s are prime examples. Dickinson went on to secure financial backing from a wealthy industrialist, Ross Winans, and developed a steam powered version of his gun. Despite gaining much press attention, Dickinson's centrifugal gun saw no action during the US Civil War. So it wasn't until war were declared that the concept began to be considered again. In June 1918, Major Edward T. Moore and Saul Singer filed a patent for a centrifugal machine gun powered by an electrical motor. The motor spooled up the centrifugal barrel assembly, rotating it extremely quickly to impart centrifugal force on the projectiles. According to Julian Hatcher, the gun could fire a steel ball bearing projectile at approximately 1200 feet per second. Fire was controlled by a stop pin in the ammunition feed tube. Moore claimed that the weapon could fire a projectile up to 1.5 miles with enough force to kill a man. He also suggested that the weapon's rate of fire could approach up to 2000 rounds per minute. It appears that Moore's gun may have been tested in 1918 but Hatcher described the accuracy of Moore's gun as extremely poor. Another centrifugal design developed during World War I was E.L. Rice's half-inch centrifugal gun. Sadly, I haven't been able to find any photographs or drawings of Rice's design, but the weapon was submitted to the US National Research Council in 1917. The NRC's 1919 report states that the gun had been further developed by the NRC's physics division in Pittsburgh, but work had been slowed by a common defect which has been difficult to eliminate. Despite what the report described as a considerable headway, the weapon was subsequently abandoned amid some controversy about credit for the design. There seems to have been something of a centrifugal machine gun craze, with several more patents filed between 1917 and 1926. A Scientific American article from March 1918 even noted that every so often the daily press becomes enthused over a new centrifugal gun. One of the earliest patents granted was for a design by E.E. E. Porter, dating from January 1917. This was followed in July 1919 by inventor Herbert A. Bullard, who was granted a patent on a design which fired a disc rather than a ball. At the same time, T.A. Gano was granted a patent for a large complex looking gun shown mounted on a pedestal. In 1920, F.R. Barnes and W.W. Case were also granted patents which had been filed in 1917. In late 1921, Levi Lombard was granted a patent he had filed in March 1918. His gun had even appeared in Scientific American. From the patent and the photograph we can see that it's notably smaller than other designs and has a spade grip for aiming. This was followed in 1923 by an interesting patent from Joseph T. McNair for a centrifugal gun that could be powered by an electrical or petrol engine. Some of the patent drawings show how the gun might be mounted in an armoured car or aeroplane. 
Intriguingly, McNair and Moore appear to have actually known one another and were partners in a law firm together. While I was researching, I came across this set of images from a March 1922 edition of Popular Mechanics, showing an unnamed centrifugal machine gun set up on a truck, powered by an engine on the truck bed. From the images, it appears to be similar to Moore's gun, with a single rotating barrel. The captions also note that the photographs were taken in New Jersey, and Moore was a major with the New Jersey National Guard, which may indicate that the gun is in fact Moore's. Another of the later designs dating from the period comes from Victor Checker, a US Marine Corps technical sergeant, who is perhaps best known as the supply officer of Admiral Richard Byrd's first two expeditions to the Antarctic. I hope I am pronouncing Victor's name properly. I'm not 100% certain on the correct pronunciation, but Checker was granted a patent for his centrifugal machine gun in January 1922. The question is, which gun is featured in the footage? The most likely bets are Moore and the Chekka. The gentleman pouring shot into the gun's hopper bears a striking resemblance to Chekka. Sadly, even if we slow down the footage to about 35% of its original speed, we don't see a great deal relating to how the gun works. But we can see the operator feeding in the ball bearing projectiles into the hopper, which appears to have a powered feed system. He empties two cylindrical containers full of projectiles in one after another, but it's unclear how many rounds might be in the containers, and a guess perhaps 50 each. The gun itself and its motor are mounted on a truck bed with a soldier in uniform who appears to be aiming the gun via a tiller. From the exhaust fumes rising up, it would be my guess that the gun is being run from a separate petrol engine mounted on the truck bed. Sadly, with only a side view and just 18 seconds of footage, we don't have much to go on. Towards the end of the clip, we get a look at the impact of the gun's fire, with two men examining a roughly 12-foot group on a board target, showing hundreds of holes. Sadly, neither the footage nor the real notes give us any real indication of the range the target was set at. However, with some further digging, I managed to find several articles referring to the guns in the US Army Ordnance Journal. Interestingly, a photo from the same demonstration is printed in one article from late October 1920, with the caption confirming that the man loading the weapon is the inventor. However, he isn't named. The footage was filmed during the second annual meeting of the US Army Ordnance Association. Another article dating from May 1921 also notes that the tests took place at the Aberdeen Proving Ground, with the gun firing at 16,000 revolutions per minute, which required 98 horsepower from the engine powering it. The gun apparently needed a very rapid increase in power required for operation, when the speed of its revolutions was increased incrementally from 12,000 to 16,000 RPM. The article concluded that a horsepower above 100 would have no material effect in increasing the speed, suggesting that a much more powerful and therefore larger engine would be needed to increase the revolution rate. Another article from the July 1920 edition of the journal, written by Julian Hatcher on the future of machine guns, included a photograph of the centrifugal gun's 50 calibre 137 grain ammunition. Hatcher notes that the idea has been so popular that there are no less than 96 extant patents for the different varieties of centrifugal gun. He states the main concerns with guns were that the weapon and the engines needed to power them were bulky, and the fact that the projectiles were round and relatively unsteady in flight. Despite this, he felt that the guns might find a place of usefulness on tanks or armoured cars where the engine is able to furnish power for it, or on airplanes. He also suggested they might find some use in the defence of permanent works when a power plant could be installed, or against large targets at short distances. The device should be very effective, and Hatcher concluded that the guns had the merit of using very simple and cheap ammunition. The real notes describing what is seen in each section of the film describe the gun as being in the experimental stages only, and that the prototype seen here is intended for use as an aircraft armament. 
for tanks and for landing parties of the frontline trenches. Despite various designs seeing some US military interest and testing, none were ever adopted and little information on them is available. There are relatively few photos of centrifugal machine guns, so stumbling across footage was an extremely lucky and exciting find. I never imagined I'd see footage of one of these guns actually in action. They have a fascinating history, so I thought it'd be well worth covering in a video. So why didn't they take off? It seems that they were relatively cumbersome weapons with extremely varying accuracy. But this footage at least proves the concept. A short report in the May 1921 edition of Scientific American may shed some light. It states that an unnamed gun was rejected because of its great weight and inability to obtain high initial velocity, concluding that no centrifugal gun can have military value. It appears that the range of the centrifugal guns was limited by the speed of their revolution, which in turn was limited by the power of the engine or motor that powered them and the larger the motor, the more cumbersome the weapon system was. Thank you very much for watching guys, I hope you found this footage as interesting as I did. It's amazing what you can find when you go digging in the archives. If you enjoyed the video you can help support the channel in a couple of ways. Sharing the video with friends and helping us get the word out is very important. And secondly you can also support us over on Patreon as well. We post regular behind the scenes stuff there and we have some perks including cool tab stickers. As always, thanks for your support and thank you for watching. See you in the next one.